Where do we go from here? Since the dawn of the space age, the scientific exploration of our solar system and the universe at large has been one of steps, from increasingly large, more capable telescopes to exploratory spacecraft that can perform tasks remotely on planets like Mars that only a few decades ago were almost out of reach. Each new step in advancing our exploration of space takes us to a new set of steps, much like a choose-your-own-adventure story, a process likely to never end if we move on to explore other star systems. As NASA Chief Scientist, my guest today helps guide that process of taking new steps, including the exploration of places like Mars and Titan, with new probes that will no doubt yield new findings that will lead to new steps in the process of understanding this amazing universe in which we live. You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Jim Green. Dr. Green has served as NASA's chief scientist since May 2018. Before that, he was the director of the Planetary Science Division at NASA headquarters. Under his leadership, several missions have been successfully executed, including the New Horizons spacecraft flyby of Pluto, the Messenger spacecraft to Mercury, the Juno spacecraft to Jupiter, the Grail spacecraft to the Moon, the Dawn spacecraft to Vesta and Ceres, and the landing of the Curiosity rover on Mars. Dr. Green received his PhD in space physics from the University of Iowa in 1979 and began working in magnetospheric physics branch at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in 1980. In 1988, he received the Arthur S. Fleming Award for Outstanding Individual Performance in the federal government and was awarded Japan's Kotani Prize in 1996 in recognition for his international science data management activities. He also recently received the NASA Exceptional Achievement Medal for the New Horizons flyby of the Pluto system. Jim Green, welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Now, Jim, it is one of the most exciting periods in my lifetime for NASA right now. We, we have returned to space from American soil and we have successfully launched the next in the long series of Mars rovers, Perseverance. And Perseverance is noteworthy because it has sort of a, a legacy on it. Years ago, the Planetary Society attempted to send a microphone to Mars yes, so that we could hear the sounds. Yes. And unfortunately, the probe that it was on failed, so we never got to hear Mars. Finally, we're going to get to do that. What can we expect to yep. hear from the Mars microphone? <laughs> well, actually, there's two microphones. Uh, I really wanted in this mission, uh, when, because I was head of planetary at the time and, and uh, was helping define and move forward with what has now become perseverance, I really wanted to have the opportunity to revive that concept that the Planetary Society was so passionate about, and I was too. The ability uh, in an atmosphere, as the wind blows, as the soil freezes and heats up and goes through cycles, and, and, the, and, and the sounds that may occur, particularly as the rover moves, was really important to do. And so the two microphones that we have, one we would call an engineering microphone. It's on the body of Perseverance, and that's designed to pick up sounds. And those sounds would be used from a perspective of how well the rover is operating. You know, it, you know, it, it, as it moves um, over the surface of Mars, we're going to hear the creaking and cracking. We're going to hear the, the, the moving of the wheels. And we want to be able to hear the sounds of the rover operating as it naturally would, you know. And if we hear variations of that later on, 
that may give us a hint that something is wearing out, whether it's metal to metal or the actuators are running out of lubrication. You know, something may happen that gives us the heads up that allows us then to plan around it and to preserve the resources that, that we've put so hard, worked so hard to put on the surface of Mars. Now, the other microphone is associated with MassCam. So it's, it's on top of the, of, the, of the long neck of the rover, of that mast that sits up. And, and to give you an idea how high that is, if I am, I am 6'4", if I stood next to Perseverance and, and looked right at mass cam, my eyes would be right there. So actually, the top of the rover is just a little taller than I am. So the, the cameras that uh, are taking images of the surface of Mars from MathCam are actually at eye level. And so you get great stereo viewing, just as if you were standing on the surface yourself. And, of course, now we've got the microphone there. Now, a, a microphone lower down on the body and then, uh, uh, you know, three or four feet taller up on the mast one may or may not expect to, to hear things differently, but because the atmosphere is so thin, even variations in the pressure from the surface up to uh, several meters high may indeed give a slightly different variation to the sound. So I'm real excited about having the opportunity to not only have those two recording at the same time, but be able to compare those. And then, of course, uh, I don't expect at night, as the rover is sitting there, maybe munging and doing a number of things with the data it's collected during the day, I don't expect it at night to hear crickets, okay? <laughs> no pun intended. But the concept of being able to just sit and listen to sounds from another planet, it, to me, is just really, uh, you know, energizing. It's just really exciting. I'm just baited breath because we don't really know what we're going to hear. Can you predict what we might hear? I would expect that sound doesn't really travel as far on Mars as it does here. I could be wrong on that. But say a dust devil or something like that hits the uh, rover, which used to happen with uh, sure, <laughs> Spirit. Sure, all the time. And, uh, yeah. Right. So say that happens. What would we hear? What do, you, what do you think we would hear? Well, there's a good chance we'll hear it. And the reason why is uh, not so much uh, the, the, its talcum powder-like consistency for the dust, uh, not so much that you, you know, we're going to hear it you know, hitting, hitting uh, the wheels or something low, but indeed um, it'll hit the microphones. You know, and we'll, we'll hear these little specks. The, the range of how, how far around we would hear that is going to actually depend, I think, on the wind velocity. So what do we know about the wind? Well, we have weather stations on Curiosity, you know, and we have also weather information, pressure, temperature from wind speed, from InSight. You know, we've been collecting this data for long periods of time. And we've actually developed global circulation models of Mars, you know, where we actually can predict potentially how extensive dust storms can be once they get started. We can see uh, diurnal cycles in temperature and pressure. You know, the change from winter to summer, there's a pressure wave of, of, of carbon dioxide that blows over the planet during these time periods. We're going to be able, I think, to hear some of those phenomena. And we do know that the wind can be pretty brisk. It can be up to 125 miles per hour. Okay? But the pressure is so low, that's not enough to straighten a U.S. flag sitting on the surface, for instance. So the, uh, the rules are different in that rarefied atmosphere for winds. But it's still enough... You know, you say that the talcum powder like dust, it's still enough to envelop that planet in global dust storms occasionally. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. When that happens, would we hear anything? Uh, yes and no, in the sense that um, dust storms on Mars, you know, are, are not like what Mark Watney experienced. It's just not going to happen. All right. Uh, they can go global. Uh, they can uh, move quite quickly. They can envelop the planet. 
But what happens is it, it primarily starts out at relatively high altitudes. And, and it just, it, it, it's like all of a sudden over time, the sky starts to dim. Because what's happening is as the, as the particulate matter, as the dust, it's suspended at higher altitudes, it's reflecting that sunlight back out into space. And so consequently, you know, you can you, you then see that the day turns gradually into dusk. And then, of course, if it's really bad, it, it gets very dark. All right. Our imagers see that. Spirit and Opportunity saw that come and go. You know, they went through a couple dust storms. Uh, Opportunity did. And the last one actually is what took it out. Dust storms uh, can occur every southern summer okay so every 680 days or so in the southern hemisphere uh it, it, mars's elliptical orbit uh, puts it at a point uh, at a place where it is closest to the sun and that that ends up heating uh, the planet in such a way that the dust can get lofted and and then and then actually uh move outward uh from from where it may originate um, and so then the dust eventually will settle out and we'll hear some of that settling. We'll hear some of that dust coming down. And as I mentioned, we'll, you know, uh, we'll be hearing it, I think, as it, as it um, uh, may get close to the mic or touch the mic as it, as it falls out of the atmosphere. You know, always our big worry was, uh, you know, when we landed Spirit and Opportunity, you know, they would be there for 90 days because we knew the atmosphere was so dusty that over time, uh, the solar panels would get uh, clogged and then we couldn't power the battery and then uh, everything would shut down. But of course, the atmospheric dynamics, which we didn't really understand very well at the time, kept those two rovers alive for, you know, for many, many years. Opportunity going into its 13th and 14th year was pretty spectacular. Intended originally for only 90 days. Well, that's only because we, we were pretty ignorant about the, the total environment it was going into. Mm -hmm. But now we know. Well, even still, though, I mean, that's a lot of traveling for a rover, <laughs> 14 years. And as I recall, didn't Spirit actually wear out and have to drag <laughs> one of the wheels? Yeah, it did. It did. But it is still a testament. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It's a testament to our ability, our imagination, and our ability to understand the system so thoroughly that we have landed and its capability and its assets with a team of, of diverse uh, people that can come up with really creative ways to keep things going, to keep doing science, to keep making something happen for the agency. And, and uh, you know, NASA's known for that. NASA's been doing that forever. I, you, you'd be shocked at how many times, uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the group managing the Voyagers reprogrammed, you know, a piddly amount of memory to make it do the spectacular stuff that it was able to do. You know, those are technologies when it was launched in the 70s that really came out of the 60s, okay? And so we're talking about really uh, primitive computers with hardly any address space, you know, not not huge memories. You know, it just just uh, really, uh, you know, you would you would never even consider using a computer and capability like that today. It'd just be forgot it. You couldn't you couldn't you couldn't stand it. <laughs> but we made those things work. Now, long term, we have curiosity and now perseverance, and these are nuclear powered essentially they they have rtgs that runs them so they don't need the sun or solar energy on mars right now right. we have other spacecraft where we've used this notably voyager which decades later we still hear from yes long term say these rovers last years and years and years longer than what uh, they originally were were intended to ultimately you're going to lose energy from the decay of the power supply right so is there a way to work them like Voyager, you sure. know, turn them into, um, sure. you know, stationary, you know, platforms and things like that and keep them going for decades and decades? Well, there is, of course, the, that limitation. So just to contrast the two, solar arrays require the sun. 
and the spur and opportunity had solar panels and that, that took that sunlight and charged up a battery. And then the battery ran the experiments. And then over time, as the battery went uh, ran down, you know, they would change its operational scenario. You know, they would change, you know, if this set of instruments were making measurements that were real power hogs, we would do that only at a time when the battery was fully charged uh, and only in the right places. And then there were times when, okay, we're going to win her over. So how we win her over is we will take local measurements, like, like weather information, for instance, because we can do that without moving arms and, and a whole bunch of things. But we're going to have to find a hill, drive up the hill, such that the sun can shine straight on the panels and get maximum amount of energy out of the sun. So that power management, you know, was really active. Well, in a similar way, but not so intense, the radioisotope power capability on, on Curiosity and now Perseverance enables the rover uh, to uh, not require the sun. How that works is we have plutonium-238, which as it decays, which means that the nucleus literally explodes in, in, from uranium, it becomes other elements. And one of the other elements it become, becomes is a, is a helium nuclei, which, which uh, uh, then uh, as those uh, explosions in the atoms occur, they hit a thermal couple, which then uh, heats up. You know, so these, these, uh, the, this accumulated uh, uh, plutonium, it glows red. I mean, it's just constantly decaying. And so that thermal couple heats up, and then we take the, the temperature difference in the thermal couple and allow that uh, to have a, a voltage difference, which then is used to, of course, charge the battery. And the battery is used to run the experiments. And so we know the decay rate of the plutonium based on how much we have available. And we'll start out with 110 or 50 power in the in the RTG and it will decay a percent or two a year okay predictably all right we can calculate that and we know it and we measured it and that is exactly what happened so so long as the circuitry and everything is healthy we can keep charging up that battery it's just like having your cell phone plugged into the wall all the time now when it gets down to a certain level maybe in five, eight, ten years, you know, on that order, well beyond its expected life of just a, a couple years, it will do power management. We will run the rover in certain ways, run experiments in certain ways, allowing the battery to charge up and then put it back into operation. And that whole process works really well. Another thing that we do is we keep the battery warm. Now, the temperature on Mars is really low. The average temperature is 40 or 50 degrees below zero. That's the average temperature, okay? So it's pretty cold, and it may get up uh, to 40 or 50 degrees, you know, um, uh, during the day in and around the equator, you know, uh, uh, with the sun directly overhead. So... The temperature will, will change by, you know, 160 degrees Fahrenheit a day. You know, just huge variations in the temperature. And, and so that's really hard on everything. And in particular, so we use a, a wonderful insulation. And that insulation is aerogel. We pack the battery in aerogel, Okay. Now that's the same stuff we used when we when we uh, had um, um, you know our comet flyby, um, you know stardust where where stardust flew through the coma of a comet, picking up dust and putting it in the air gel, and then we we uh, uh, enclosed that air gel, brought it back, and it's sitting in our laboratory at the Johnson Space Center in our extraterrestrial curation facility where we then extract the dust grains out of the aerogel and analyze it. 
but it turns out to be this spectacular insulator. So aerogel is also ridiculously light, right? Yes. So you can save a lot of weight simply by using that yes. as your insulation as opposed to, you know, I don't know, fiberglass or something. Yeah, we love it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tremendously versatile. Now, there is another aspect of this mission that's absolutely amazing. Ingenuity. Yeah. We are going to have a little tiny helicopter operating on Mars. Now, this is a technology demonstration, fundamentally. I realized that. But so was, you know, long ago, Sojourner, little tiny rover, just showing that we could have rovers on Mars and look what we have now. So maybe in the future, <laughs> much greater things will come from what we learned from Ingenuity. What is Ingenuity going to do? So you're right. Uh, Ingenuity is a uh, technology demonstration. This is the first time we'll ever attempt flying anything on its own mobility in an atmosphere of another planet. It's a pretty spectacular concept. And if it works, indeed, as you say, it will open up an enormous number of doors. Ingenuity is um, bolted to the bottom belly pan of Perseverance. And after Perseverance lands, it will drop Ingenuity on the ground, okay, and then drive away going probably, you know, 50, 75 meters away, and then command Ingenuity to turn on. Now, Ingenuity, you can imagine a, um, a little box, uh, like a, a, a cell of a CubeSat, you know, maybe, maybe five or six inches by five or six inches by five or six inches, nice little square box. In that box is battery and um, a camera capability with uh, radio uh, capability to then take data, store it, and then send it back to the rover. Okay, send it back to Percy. And of course, run these two blades, and their long blades are about four feet in length that are connected like an X, and they counter-rotate. And because of that counter-rotation, you don't need a tail blade. And so we're going to run that at, at, at an enormous RPM, revolutions per minute. And then once we give it the command to turn on, we're going to perform a, a series of maneuvers. The first one is a simple one. It's go up several feet, you know, five feet or so, and hover, and then set down. Very simple, you know, uh, just rise and come down. And, and once it does that, then it's going to telemeter all the information, all the images that it took back to the rover. And then the rover will take that and send it back to an orbiter. We have orbiters that are going around Mars. And then from those orbiters, there are relay orbiters, they're going to send that back to Earth. That's how we communicate with assets on the surface. And in that way, we're not, we don't have Percy uh, or Curiosity for that matter, driving with a big trailer and a big dish behind it, you know, and, and pulling the trailer, all right? And so that we had a dish that we can send anything back to Earth. We, we use the capability of our orbiters to be the relay. So then we'll charge up the battery, you know, while we're analyzing the data back at the ranch, you know, back at JPL and, and take a look at it. And then we'll decide, okay, we're ready for test two. So test two, Test two will be, a, a once again, we're gonna pick it up, but then we're gonna translate. We're gonna fly parallel to the surface for maybe 10 meters or so. And while we do that, it's gonna be taking data and images, and then we're gonna set it down. So it'll, it'll form this U shape, all right? And then we'll send that back through the orbiters, as I mentioned before, analyze it. And then the next day, it will charge it up, now we're ready to go. The next thing, is indeed we're gonna now take off. If all that is working, we have all the fundamentals ready to go, we're now gonna put it through uh, even more strenuous tests. So we're gonna then uh, fly up, go tr then uh, at, a, at a particular height, you know, maybe 10 feet or so, we're gonna take off. And we're gonna go 50 meters, maybe more, and then come back and then land exactly in the same place that we took off, you know? And so th those are a series of tests that we're gonna perform. At the end of those tests, 
And there are a couple others that are similar to that. At the end of those tests, we're then ready to put the helicopter into service. And okay, so what kind of service are we talking about? Well, one of the toughest things to do about driving rovers on Mars is to chart its path, okay? There's no roads on Mars, obviously, uh, but indeed there, there are valleys, there's hills, there's sand traps, you know, that means there's craters that have occurred for which the, the dust has uh, flowed for, you know, uh, millions of years perhaps and filled in, filled in the crater. We can't even see, see that it will, we'd collapse into it if we drove into it. This is what actually happened to Opportunity, by the way. And so consequently then, uh, I'm sorry, Spirit. Uh, so consequently, then um, we want to be able to get high resolution images in a direction that we expect the perseverance to go. And so Ingenuity could provide that for us. And, and that's what we'd like for it to do. Once we do that, you know, then we know this kind of technology has a bright future on Mars. I can imagine a future for which we would have a series of helicopters much more capable, much larger, landing. Uh, we could drop them off in certain areas and then also have a relay station for which then these helicopters can go you know, enormous distances and, and then radio back information, which then can come back. Now, one of the one of the features, you know, that we have on Mars is um, what we call uh, reoccurring slope lineage. These are regions on the sides of craters for which we believe during certain times of the year, water will flow down. Well, the pressure's so low, water doesn't stay liquid for hardly any time unless it's really briny. And we believe this is kind of briny and it will last now for many minutes. And so water will flow down the sides of the crater and then eventually evaporate. And that happens during the summer when the, the sun is shining on the sides of the crater. And what we think is happening is there's underground aquifers. And these underground aquifers, it's so cold that there's an ice plug at the end of them. And when the sun shines on them, that ice sublimates and the water pours out down the crater wall. Wow, that's spectacular. You know, how can we... How can we look into these aquifers? How could we make measurements and see if there's methane, you know, with another indicator of life that may occur in these aquifers if we can get to it? The only way to do it is in these craters where the RSLs are that we can go up with a helicopter and look right into the origin of these streaks that we see on the sides of the crater. And that's what the helicopters could do easily. Now that is liquid water, which brings us to our next topic to tackle. Life on Mars, past and possibly even present, because if you've got an aquifer with liquid water flowing through it, anything that may have once lived on Mars' surface may still be there, right? Right, that's right. So do we think life is on Mars in the, in the past? Well, one of the things that Perseverance is gonna do is to go to a region where we have high confidence that there could be signatures of past life, and that is Jezero Crater. Now, Jezero Crater is an impact that occurred billions of years ago, and that impact occurred at a really unique location. And that location is a place where water from rivers flowed into the ancient ocean of Mars. So it, this crater, this impact occurred right at the ancient shoreline when Mars was a blue planet. We know enormous amount of water flowed on Mars. Two thirds of the Northern hemisphere was underwater and in some places more than a mile and a half deep. And, and something happened, the climate changed rapidly, the water started evaporating and now Mars is this arid world we see. So by going to Jezero Crater, right into this area where the water flowed, bringing sediments, 
from large number of regions out on the plateau into this crater and building them up, creating a delta. And now we can see that delta from orbit. It's huge, it's enormous. And that particular area, we believe, is a great opportunity for us to interrogate, dig down, get some samples, bring them back, and see if there's any signs of ancient life on Mars. Now, the analogy of that, of course, is here on Earth. We've gone to ancient, dried-up riverbeds where there are sediments laying there, and we can dig into those sediments, and we see evidence of microbial life. So the sediments have been preserving life, past life, on Earth. And, and the concept is that's probably what it would do on Mars if we could get into this place and look deeply into these, into these sediments, into these deltas. Space is full of mysteries, and NASA's spacecraft are working hard to unlock them. What are scientists finding out? How do they do their jobs? Dr. Jim Green, NASA's chief scientist, leads discussions with some of the leading experts in planetary science and other fields to give you a guided tour of the solar system and beyond in his podcast, Gravity Assist. Dr. Green also explores how scientists get inspired to pursue careers in science, that Gravity Assist that leads them to become the explorers they are today. Head over to nasa.gov forward slash podcasts to listen to Gravity Assist or hit the link in the description below. And now, back to John with Dr. Green. Now, the geology of that, when, when we're, we're going to take samples and cores and things like that, mm -hmm. how do we get them back here? Is there any sort of plan in the works on how we oh, might sure. get those samples back here? Or what can we do in situ with the instruments that are already there at Mars? Well, we have a whole series of in situ instruments, and they're designed to help us pick the right places to be able to take the samples. For instance, right at the end of a long arm where the core is, this is where we'll core rock, uh, right at the end of that arm are, are two instruments. They're Sherlock and Pixel. Now, Sherlock is an ultraviolet spectrometer, and it's designed to study the mineralogy and the chemistry, particularly right at that surface that says, hey, this looks interesting, let's drill here. And it has a, a fabulous camera associated with it called Watson. You know, what else would you call it if the instrument was named Sherlock? And then also there, we have an instrument called Pixel. Now this is a X-ray spectrometer, and it's designed to zap an area, which then the matrix in the minerals that are sitting there will glow back and that'll give us a lot of information about the chemical composition of the rock. And so with those two sets of instruments working in tandem, we then can see, hey, this looks like an exciting place to drill. And then we drill and we create with a, with a, a, a cylindrical drill that creates a core. Now that core looks like a, a, one of the big Crayola crayons. Okay, a nice big sample. And, and we break it off, and then it moves through a system for which we then sleeve it. We put it in a, in a metal sleeve. Now, we may hold on to several of these until we get to a place, you know, where we're drilling several locations in and around where the rover is, hang on to them for a little while. And then if we decide, okay, we're pretty, pretty, thoroughly examine this area, got all the mineralogy and samples we think we need, we're then going to drive off to another area. We drop the samples. We drop the samples for later pickup. Okay? Now, in addition to the, the instruments on the arm, the rover's got a bunch of instruments. You know, there's a, uh, a laser uh, on the very top of the rover. It's called SuperCam. And this laser then blasts rock, okay? It, it literally vaporizes it, for which then we take a, a spectrum of it and we get a really good idea as to uh, its overall composition before we even go over to that area. You know, we can do that from 20 meters away. And so uh, that's a great instrument. 
uh, in addition to the cameras that we have, uh, we also have a ground penetrating radar. So as we see the stratigraphy underneath the rover change, we then get an idea of, of the setting of the rock record that we are uh, creating in the, in the caching system. So uh, if we then move from place to place, and we have actually uh, more than 40, uh, uh, we have an opportunity to drill more than 40 of these cores and lay them in piles over time, we want to thoroughly look at this particular area. But meantime, back on Earth, we're developing the next set of missions to go get them. Okay? So what do we need to go get them? Well, we're going to need a fetch rover. You know, we're going to need a real rover we can sit down on the ground that, that its job is to pick up the sticks. Okay? To take off. Uh, and go and uh, go to these piles and acquire the samples in these sample tubes, in these metal sleeves that we put them in, and then bring them back to uh, another system that will land on Mars that contains a rocket, a Mars ascent vehicle, a MAV, if you will. And then uh, that MAV will be laying down on its side and we'll feed those samples into a particular area. And once that fetch rover has brought in all the samples that we believe we need, then we're going to erect the, erect the rocket, blast it off the surface of Mars, and put those samples in orbit. You know, So it'll have a couple stages, perhaps. It'll get up to maybe 400 kilometers. You know, All these things are things that we're looking at, studying. And then, and then drop a, a, a big ball uh, that contains all these samples inside this ball, and then it'll just sit in orbit. Now, another mission is going to get into orbit around Mars and hunt that hunt that sphere down. You know, literally get into orbit, match its orbit with the with the samples that are orbiting, acquire it, and then and then break orbit, come back and drop it off here on Earth, and then they're here. And then it'll go into a facility uh, where we'll study the samples in a highly contained biological containment facility to determine that these samples are safe, not only to open, to study, but to, but to let other laboratories look at them, other organizations with tremendous capabilities to study this rock record and be a bio level four facility is probably what we're thinking. And so that will begin that analysis period of uh, really understanding the origin of Mars, how it's changed over time, aspects of climate change from the rock record. You know, our rock record here is, uh, you know, is the geological history book. Well, we're going to be bringing some of that back from Mars. And we may even be able to see samples have some indication of past life on Mars, perhaps even plant life. You know, which was some of the first things that happened here on Earth. All amid the apparent coming human exploration of Mars. So we could end up, NASA could do a repeat of the Apollo mission that visited <laughs> one of the Surveyor spacecraft and brought a camera back. So you may end up with like a mast cam back or something from humans on Mars, too. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty slick. It would definitely, definitely one for the Smithsonian. Now, one of the more tantalizing clues that Mars shows us are the methane blooms. Yeah. And could be geological, but could be biological. Yeah. Is there anything on Perseverance that's going to increase our knowledge of those? Not on Perseverance, but there certainly is on Curiosity. And, uh, you know, Curiosity is very healthy. Its RTG is still cranking out a lot of power. The instrument called SAM which is a sample analysis on Mars instrument from Goddard Space Flight Center, is working perfectly. That's the instrument that is involved in, you know, uh, sniffing the atmosphere. And that's the one that has seen the, the, the methane increased. So methane is what we would call one of the atmospheric life gases. Okay, so is oxygen. So is free O2. And we're measuring that too, by the way. We see the O2 
peak up just like the methane does during the summer and then start dying away, you know, uh, during during the fall and winter months. But the oxygen is being depleted far faster than the methane does. So we don't know what's generating the oxygen and we don't know what's depleting the oxygen. It is a real puzzle. So these two life gases could be generated by biology. It could also be generated abiotically, which means not by geology. But it's, it's giving us really exciting set of information about the potential for current life on Mars. Now, with those two gases, though, the oxygen and the methane being, is it, is it sort of less likely that both of those would be produced abiotically at the same time by the same process, presumably. So even though we don't know how the oxygen is being generated, we do know because of the season, you have a couple things in play. Well, here on Earth, you get into the spring and the summer and everything just seems to take off and grow. You know, that's a, there's, you know, you get uh, the bloom of the, of the season associated with the plant life. On Mars, what happens is, uh, as you get into that season, the temperature is warmer. The temperature is warmer, and there's water in frozen states underneath the soil, and that warms up. Then, then perhaps the barrier where this gas is generated uh, underneath the surface is, is becoming more porous, and the methane and oxygen leak out. And so maybe it's been there all along. You know, maybe maybe this is being generated um, uh, abiotically. You can generate methane if you've got the right minerals and the right heat, along with water, underneath the uh, underneath the surface of Mars. And we think all that is is indeed um, there. Uh, and then, you know, methane can be generated in in these uh, in this process. And then it's trapped. And then during the summer, it just kind of leaks out. All that's possible. But so is life, you know, that we haven't, we haven't excluded that as an explanation. So what you're, what you're witnessing is we have a series of fantastic measurements. These are what we call um, uh, speculations about life and, and, and giving us, if you look in total, uh, you know, uh, all, all this speculation that, um, that, that all that is good positive information about the potential for life. So what, it, what are they? Well, water. Here on Earth, everywhere where there's water, we've gone and we've looked, there's life. And we see water in various states on, on Mars, mostly frozen, but sometimes, you know, as, as we just talked about, it could be liquid water. Check. Okay, what about these life gases like methane and oxygen? Check, okay? Circumstantial evidence that life may exist there. What about habitable environments? Are there complex organic molecules there? Check, okay? There's carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Everything that make up uh, uh, life as we know it. Check, all right? It's in the soils. The soils have nitrates in them, okay? Here on Earth, nitrates are great for fertilizer, and they're moist. Check, check, all right? So all this, you know, all this circumstantial evidence is, is, is uh, stacking up to make this a tremendously exciting planet in terms of um, its potential for past life and maybe some indication of current life. Now, what, what might this life be like? It doesn't seem that Mars could really only support some sort of microbial life, some, you know, some analog of a bacteria or something like that. Or do you think it could get a little bit more complex than that? Might we find algae, you know, or that oxygen might suggest photosynthesis of some type, maybe. What would we expect from Martian life should we find it? All right. So uh, we can't rule those out. We can't say, oh, no way, that's not, you know, we can't even think about these things. And, uh, uh, and we do think about them because we can't rule them out. And the rock, so let's go back to the rock record. You know, we're bringing back the samples of pages of the 
geological history of Mars. Great, that's what we want. We want to know how Mars evolved. But there's more, much more. Let's take an Earth analogy. There are more than 4,700 minerals on this Earth, and 300 of them can only be made if life was there. It's here on Earth. We make those minerals. If we find those minerals on Mars, it's game over. We bring those samples back, all right? We're going we're gonna to, in our laboratory, see that rock record, go back in time, and see if Mars had minerals where life contributed, lived, died, and contributed to that fossil record. And then it tells us Mars had past life. And as I, I mentioned a little earlier, it could have started out as plant life. You know, the, the atmosphere was probably dominated by CO2, even, even in its past history. So today, you know, if there's life on Mars, it's, it's got to be uh, under the ground. It's not going to be on the surface. We, we're pretty sure of that part. The methane leaks through the surface. You know, the material we're finding was, is conducive uh, uh, for past life in terms of, of uh, creating the, these prebiotic molecules that we actually are finding with SAM. That's complexity and chemistry. But if life exists, it probably exists in these aquifers and maybe microbial. It could be microbial life. We don't know. It could be that, that because of the way Mars is evolving, and it's it's losing its atmosphere that the life in the in, in under the under the surface is in the process of dying off we may be we may be looking at a planet where its evolutionary stage of its life is towards the end you know we are so lucky to have venus earth and mars in our solar system so that we could study and compare them because they're each at different phases and stages of their evolution, okay? You know, so what's happened on Venus could happen on Earth. What's happening on Mars could happen on Earth. And so by, by gathering this information and going after these big topics, I think we can put together an under, a better understanding as to the evolution of the life on this Earth. Now, it also has another implication, if you think about it, this star system had two, probably three, liquid water worlds. <laughs> yes. And while two of them no longer are, there was a time that they were. So what does that say about exoplanets? Right. So you're referring to the terrestrial planets, okay? Uh, but in reality, there's, there's also opportunities for life in the ocean worlds. You know, these are um, uh, these are moons that orbit these giant planets. So let's not forget them. All right. So I, I, I believe that, you know, NASA's approach in the area of searching for life it is a really important one. We're looking for life in the solar system. We're also looking for life beyond our solar system. We're looking for similar Earths. You know, we're looking for Earth-like planets. Well, we have found Earth sized planets, even some in or near what we would call the habitable zone, but we can't tell it, how much they are like us. It could be all Venuses, for instance. And, and we don't think Venus has life on its surface at all. You know, it has huge pressure and temperature, and, uh, and there's nothing we can think of that could, could, we could even imagine living on the surface of Venus at the moment. But in its past, it also was a blue world. There's plenty of indication that early on in the solar system, uh, when the sun was young and, and, uh, and, and, and the planets had just been formed and, and were evolving, that Venus, Earth, and Mars were all blue planets. That's pretty spectacular. And that's a relatively recent understanding. And it, it would seem to suggest that blue planets are not rare in the universe. Yeah, I agree. Uh, let me tell you, um, the solar system is a soggy place. You, you look out and you look at the amount of water in the giant planets. 
And you look at the, the amount of water in the outer part of our solar system, at Pluto and the Kuiper Belt, you know, we've got, we've got an enormous amount of water in the solar system in reality. It's just in different phases, you know, uh, some of it liquid, some of it uh, gas, some of it solid, uh, some of it is, is, uh, has been crushed to the point where it's, it's, it's stronger than granite. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's a real fundamental building block of our own planetary system. Uh, in uh, in our solar system, and um, uh, there's no reason to think that th that it isn't pervasive, at least in our arm or in our local neighborhood, and maybe even further. And we're seeing a lot of the a lot of the same stuff on uh, in clouds of gases very far away from Earth. So um, I think water is a fundamental molecule that forms early on that that is absolutely essential for life as we know it, and that makes us believe that these exoplanets that could also have the potential for harboring life. And one thing that's going to happen finally soon, relatively soon, is the addition of the James Webb Space Telescope to our arsenal, yes. which will help us characterize some of these nearby exoplanets. That's right, that's right. Now, we're finally gonna launch. When is the launch date for James Webb? Okay, so it was recently announced and it's October of next year, October 2021. And first light, I guess, after testing the instruments will be some months after that, right? Oh, yeah, several months, four or five months, I believe. It's got to get into position. I mean, it, they have a lot of things to do. <laughs> They're going to be busy. They're going to be real busy on that one. You know, it's all it's all folded up like, you know, the mysteries of origami. And, and it, it's all got to come out and it's got to deploy. And then it's got to get into uh, get into L2, which is... Uh, uh, behind the Earth in a very special place, and then it's going to uh, be oriented such that uh, you know the the sunshade uh, constantly blocks the sun, and uh, uh, then everything's got to get cold uh, so that we can uh, really use its capability to observe in the infrared, which is very important. It's a very important wavelength regime for us. Now back to life in the solar system. We were mainly just talking about terrestrial planets. Mm -hmm. Now. That's actually, there's an even greater opportunity because of all of these ice shell moons where you have liquid water suspected underneath a shell of ice. Yeah. And this, this includes uh, obviously Europa and Enceladus, but also places like Ganymede, <laughs> you know, and mm -hmm. I think Oberon and, mm -hmm. you know, all of these different places. It seems like there's a chance for life and in all of the outer solar system, planetary systems. Europa does seem to be the most exciting candidate, though. What are we going to do to try to determine whether there is a, a biosphere under that ice at Europa? So one of the exciting things about Europa is it's a moon about the size of our own moon. It's sitting in orbit around Jupiter at a place where the tidal forces from Jupiter because it's in a slightly elliptical orbit, when the moon is close to Jupiter, what would you call that, perijove, you know, Jupiter squeezes it. And then when it's a little further away, called apogee in its orbit, the, the squeeze from Jupiter isn't quite so much. And so every couple days, as, as this moon orbits Jupiter, it's going through the squeeze and release and squeeze and release. In fact, the surface, we believe the surface moves up and down as much as 30 meters every couple of days. You know, in, in, once in its orbit, it's doing this. You know, this is unbelievable when you think about it. And, and so that tidal force produces heat. Where's the heat going? Well, it's, it's heating the ice and melting it and it's creating the ocean, and it's keeping the water warm. It's doing it to the core of the planet, and the core of the planet then is, as it's being squeezed, it has to be also interacting with uh, the ocean. In fact, I believe I know what the inside of Europa looks like. All you have to do is look at Io. Io is closer to Jupiter than Europa is, and it has lost its ice shell. The tidal forces have been so great that the ice is gone, the water is gone, 
and what we're looking at are volcanoes as Jupiter squeezes that rock, that, that body, which is about the size of our moon, over and over again, every orbit. And, and, and so consequently, you're literally turning Io inside out. Io, you need a Google, new Google map of Io every 80 years, we, we, we estimate. A, a hundred volcanoes active all the time going on. As you move further away from Jupiter, that tidal force becomes less. And Europa is just at the perfect place, such that the tidal forces aren't so great to dissipate the ice shell and the ocean. And it is maintained. And it's been that way since it was created four and a half billion years ago. Now, to me, we, we don't talk about this much, but, but for, for life, we, we don't know how it starts, but there is one element of life in addition to the water and the right chemicals and, and, and in the right uh, configurations is time. I mean, there, there's got to be time in the equation. Here on Earth, life just didn't spring up all at once. It took a little time for whatever that life-giving process, for whatever that, that event that occurred that really started us off to happen. And so time is an important part of the equation, and Europa has got it. If there's any body in the solar system that, had, uh, that has all the right stuff and time to make life, you know, my bet's on Europa. Now, I, I think it's not going to be just microbial life. It's had time to make more complex life, okay? And this is tremendously exciting. And so where does that life live? Does it swim in the ocean? And, you know, and, 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 and so for us, what we want to do is we go to the Antarctic and we look at the Antarctic ice shelves that stick out over the ocean. And we get underneath them. And we see that ice ocean interface and it's full of life. Life loves these interfaces. We go to the bottom of our own ocean where there's hydrothermal vents, you know, where, where th there's plates that are moving and that also uh, creates the energy necessary in the interior of the earth for, for uh, uh, material to pass through, heat up, bring up nutrients, you know, hydrothermal vents were only found originally in the ocean in 1978, okay? I, I'm older than that, all right? And I was around when we first found the first hydrothermal vent in the ocean. We now have been to about 300 of them. There's probably tens of thousands of them down there. And each and every one that we've been at is teeming with life. Whether the water that's coming out is alkaline or acidic, they're still teeming with life. That's, that, that environment is so similar, I think, to what may be happening at the bottom of the ocean on Europa, that I, I can just imagine the more complex life that might be living there. This is, you know, just a tremendous opportunity for us to interrogate that. And our first mission, called Clipper, is going to do just that. Now, it can't get under the ice. Well, one of the features that we have found out in the last 10 years that's really been exciting is that the ocean is indeed communicating with the surface. It has to. You look at the surface, you look at uh, uh, where are the craters on Europa. You can only find a few craters on Europa. All the craters that have occurred, all the impacts that have occurred on Europa have been filled in. That means the water has come up and it has filled in those, those craters. It's come up through the cracks. Europa's just full of cracks. And in fact, we have seen geysers now, primarily from Hubble. You know, we've made a number of observations where we do see these walls of water coming out but also we've gone back into Galileo data and realized that we flow through, flew through two plumes of water uh, uh, at, uh, at Europa. And, and, you know, I've talked to many of the scientists and they remember the data. They didn't understand the data to the point where they couldn't publish anything because they couldn't make any sense out of it. Now we can make sense out of it. So we expect the life to come to us. 
So Clipper is going to, is actually an orbiter of Jupiter and Europa. So as it, as it orbits Jupiter, it's going to come out of the radi Jovian radiation belts. It's going to, it's going to uh, with its cameras, look at Europa looking for plumes. And then as it swings around, it's going to fly back into the radiation belts, fly by Europa. And, and we're going to want to target the, the plumes. We're going to want to fly through the plumes. And it's got some tremendously important instruments on it to be able to make some great measurements. So we're hoping the life will come to us. And then, if that is the case, and we get some positive indications, then we're going to want to get down to the surface and get into the cracks and get into the ice-water interfaces because that will be teeming with life if it's like anything that we see here on Earth. Now, if it is, and this brings up the idea of convergent evolution, if it is complex, or there is complexity there, mm -hmm. you, might, you might see some really interesting things below that shell of ice, like bioluminescence and things that we see deep, deep in our oceans. Sure. And you might see the same things. I think it's going to be even better than that. And here's why. If we turned off the sun, Jupiter would still glow in the infrared, okay? Jupiter is 300 Earth masses. You know, it's an enormous body, and it radiates in the infrared. It's, it's, it's like it's still cooling off from when it was made, all right? Just like you put a cake in the oven, you take it out, and you sit it there, and, and you wait because it's still, it's still cooking. It, you know, it's cooling off. That's exactly what's happening to Jupiter. It generates an enormous amount of infrared. And so just think about it. That infrared light is bathing those Galilean moons. And the cracks are such, and maybe the ice in certain areas are thin, such that even though the moon is tidally locked, that means that one side of the moon in its ocean, and the ocean we believe is everywhere around the core, it may be lit by ultra uh, infrared light coming from Jupiter where the intensity might increase in these areas where, where it comes through the cracks. So, so that's, that's light that may affect the evolution of complex life that could be in the ocean. Now, I have to say that it's one speculation after another, but that may be true, and we're going to find out. If complex life were found in an ice shell moon like Europa, or maybe, maybe even several of them, maybe even uh, mm -hmm. distant Kuiper Belt objects or something that they've got radioactive de decay heating the, uh, True. heating the core. Yeah, and there's, we believe there's water underneath the surface of Pluto. Yeah, in a, in, in, in a shell, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And this makes the idea of a habitable zone sort of moot because your entire <laughs> star system is essentially a habitable zone at that stage for ice shell moons and planets. Mm -hmm. Now, if complex life were common in this solar system, that would suggest it's probably, <laughs> probably common everywhere. In which case, yeah, I would, I'd, I'd even forget the suggestion. It's got to be everywhere. It's got to be everywhere. Yeah, now <laughs> game over, man. It's everywhere. <laughs> well, even if, even if we just find a microbe that is not, that is yeah. clearly not related to Earth life, it did yeah. not get there through panspermia or anything else. It's native to Mars or Europa or whatever. That answer is essentially the question that life on Earth is definitely not alone <laughs> in that the right. universe probably teems with microbial life, at right. least. Right. Find complexity and you can start to play with ideas of intelligent life That's right. being more common than one might initially think. And this brings us to techno signatures. Correct. Now, NASA sort of shied away from SETI for many years for political reasons and things like that. But now it's a different story. It's a different question. Correct. Now it's about any Correct. sort of techno signature and NASA's right. getting back in the game. All right. What's going on there? So when we started to find exoplanets, the concept of techno signatures is really important and it's changed significantly well beyond just listening for radio waves. And the reason for that is the fact that we we're observing these planets around stars in various phases. 
when you think about what we see, we see the transiting planet, and that gives you an indication that, that's, that there's a solar system there. But we're developing a variety of instruments and capability in the future to be able to isolate that planet and look at it. So the planet, as it goes around that sun, when it's, when it's on the other side of the sun and comes out, its hemisphere will be lit and we'll look at its spectrum and we'll see what its composition is. We'll look at trace gases. Perhaps there are pollutants in the atmosphere, pollutants because of intelligent life. If we get good enough, we might be able to tell as the planet spins, and everything seems to spin in our solar system, there's no reason why planets out there don't spin too, that perhaps we can see variations in the light that is being reflected or absorbed by the planet that indicates land, ocean, clouds, changing albedo that could make it much more interesting, much like an Earth. We also can look at the planet when it starts the process of going in the transit phase. So it now is between us and the sun. And now we want to look at the night side of the planet. Is there excess heat, waste heat from energy sources? Are there some aspects of illumination, perhaps faint spectrums of light? The concepts now in terms of detecting these kind of techno signatures are, have exploded. And that's why NASA's gotten much more involved in this. And it's due, in fact, to the increased knowledge that planets are everywhere. There are more planets than there are suns. And we have plenty to do to interrogate these planets. And we're moving in that direction. All right, Jim, thanks for appearing with us today. And I look forward to watching all of these missions. And we didn't even touch on some of them, like the Titan Copter, which is about the most amazing <laughs> mission of all of them. It is, it is. We should talk about weird life one time. Now that could be really interesting because that would be low temperature life. And now that's really alien. Indeed, I mean, you know, Water is such an important element of our life as we know it, but you know, you need a liquid. That's part of the metabolism system. On Titan, it's not liquid water, it's liquid methane, you know? And so it might be life like we don't know it. Titan would be the place to go to answer that question. Absolutely amazing. And soon we'll have a helicopter there. That's right. <laughs> just, like, just like we have on, or will have on Mars. Uh, indeed. One last thing. You are also a podcaster. I am. And have had a podcast for several years now. Tell us about that. Well, the podcast is called Gravity Assist. And to me, it's really all about an intimate discussion with a scientist friend of mine. I want to invite everybody to our Starbucks table as we're sitting there talking back and forth about our science and what we're doing. And I'm trying to understand what they're doing. And so this is my fourth year. And then this season is all about the search for life. Now the name Gravity Assist comes from the fact that every one of the scientists I interview, I ask them what was the person, place, or thing that occurred to them that got them so excited, accelerated them to a new object, a new direction, like a Gravity Assist does for spacecraft that, that then use that technique to go to a different planet. And they all know it. it you know, gravity assist is, it, it happens to every one of our scientists because you're not born thinking you're going to be a scientist. I certainly wasn't. And I haven't ran into anybody yet that does that. Now, where can people find this podcast? So it's on www.nasa.gov slash podcasts. NASA has a number of them. You can go down the page and gravity assist is one of them. All right, Jim, we are out of time. I appreciate you uh, appearing with us today, and I look forward to what looks to me like another golden age of the search for life. Indeed. Well, thank you so very much. I enjoyed it. Is this a new golden age of exploration? Recent events in both private and public space initiatives seem to bear that out with no end in sight. Exciting times indeed. 